good morning, everybody. I appreciate uh, you, you making time for this uh, this ISO 45001 uh, webinar. Um, you're looking at the standard. I just wanted to show you that real quick so you can say you've at least seen it. Uh, okay, if you can keep yourself muted, um, that would be awesome. And yeah, let's just uh, let's get into this now. I, I do have some pretty impressive slides that you'll experience, <laughs> but the the goal of this uh, of this presentation is not to look at my great slides. Um, it's really to answer questions you guys may have uh, regarding the standard and so forth. So, um, yep, yeah, when we get to a, a place where you've got a question. Uh, you know, unmute yourself and just ask if you need to cut me off, that's fine. Uh, because again, my, my, my hope here is to, uh, to answer your questions um, and to make this uh, topic a bit more understandable. So briefly, we're gonna talk a little bit about the development of the standard. We'll go through the standard itself and, and then some, uh, some advice from me for how to get started. Um, here's the brought to you by EHS Management Strategies. Um, uh, a lot of you guys out there, I've, I've got a number of you folks from, from Lear, Magna, ITW, uh, a lot of great customers of mine, and I appreciate you guys showing up. Um, I've got a number of other people out there that are hopefully not getting too tired of my, my newsletter or my, my emails, but um, uh, you know, our, our core business uh, here is ISO 14,000 and 45,000 consulting training. Uh, we do a lot of internal auditing for people that, that don't have trained auditors or, or choose to outsource that. Uh, com compliance evaluations, auditor training, that is our business. So if you ever need help, you know where to go. Okay, so safety management systems. Um, the ISO people, I think got into the game a little bit late. Um, you know, you, you've had the ANSI Z10 standard out there, the, the prior OSAS 18001, uh, the UN has a, you know, international labor organization standard. Um, so, so there's been a lot of safety management system standards out there. And, and the ISO uh, people finally got into the, the game about 2018. Um, so again, in, in 99, there was the development of what they call the consensus standard of uh, OSAS 18001 uh, that a lot of companies got, got certified to. Uh, that was revised in 2007. Uh, the ANSI folks published the, the Z10 standard in 2012 and uh, ISO 45000, uh, their first version of the standard uh, was published in 2018. Um, and, and, and all the companies that were certified to 18,001 have transitioned their certifications to the, uh, the 45,001 standard. Um, it, again, you know, everyone's trying to get to this safety culture. We want safety just to be the way we do business. We don't want people to work unsafely. Um, it always, I find it very interesting that you have to yell at people to get them to work safely. <laughs> you'd think that they would, would be a little bit more interested in, the, in their own safety. But uh, I, I think that this uh, management system standard uh, does help organizations along the path towards uh, not only being in compliance with, with OSHA, uh, preventing injuries, you know, setting up this management system, and, and again, truly uh, embracing a, a safety culture, which, which is what we're all after. Um, again, I see a lot of benefit here. You know, you guys have been thinking about safety for decades. This is not a new thing. Uh, most of you guys will have what I'll call a hybrid management system already in place. But um, there really is a great deal of benefit to, to going the full way into a fully developed, uh, whether you certify it or you self-certify, uh, occupational health and safety management system. Um, it's, you know, the management system is going to be uh, performance based, uh, make you more proactive, uh, process oriented versus task oriented, uh, 
emphasizes worker participation, um, emphasizes behavior-based activities and a safety culture versus you know, yelling at people, and, and also the development of leading indicators versus focusing on, on the lagging indicators. And um, again, if even companies that have had a good OSHA-based compliance process, I think will benefit a lot through developing an, an OSAS 45001 system. Okay. I'm gonna need to call him and tell him to come in. I'm trying to figure out who's not muted. If I go up here to participants, are you? I got a couple of you not muted. Okay. Um, you know, what, what's really nice is the ISO folks finally got their act together and, and they've really aligned uh, all these standards in the same 10 sections. So pretty much everyone on the call, I think, already got a quality system that, that's certified to either 9001 or IATF. Um, uh, Jimmy, Jim, James, I'm sorry to cut you off. But a couple of things. Can you please make this thing larger, the entire uh, uh, the entire screen, so we could see it? Uh, it's kind yeah. of yes. Let me uh, let me. I'll go to I'll go to the uh, the slideshow. That'll make it bigger. How's that? Okay. Excellent. The other thing is that uh, I'm sorry. You said to cut you off if. Uh, the, if you are really good with ISO 14,000, how that, how much that will be helpful with ISO 45,000? Sure. Uh, good question. Yeah. Um, it, again, it's it's all the same stuff. Um, you know, context of the organization. Uh, you know, risk and opportunities. Uh, whether you're talking about quality risk, you're talking about environmental risk, or you're talking about safety risk. And um, you know these 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 standards are now built to be integrated. Um, so if you've already got a quality system and environmental system, um, hopefully you've started to share some integration at at that level. Uh, when you go to become certified to forty five thousand, the first place to go is to your existing processes. You, you don't want to reinvent things just for safety. Um, but there are things that are specific to safety, and we'll talk about those. But yes, if if you've already got a, a good um, ISO fourteen thousand program, integrating forty five thousand into it is is quite easy, and uh, it makes the most sense. And I'll, and I'll say most of the organizations that I've worked with to 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 document their programs in forty five thousand, uh, that's that's exactly what what we've done. Um, I bring this up. There is an, another guidance document out there. It's called ISO 31000. Um, it's it's about risk management, and I and I bring this up because this particular guidance document creates a, a nice framework for how to manage risk. And it's this is not specific to health and safety. This is a you know, how do you, how does a business manage risk? And, and I bring this up because this is a it's a good read. Um, it talks about processes to identify risk and document them and evaluate them. Um, and your business already does this. You, you already evaluate business risk and, and environmental risk and safety risk. But, but this particular standard, again, you're not certified to it. It's not a requirement, um, but I've read through it and it, and it really explains this concept of, of risk and, and how to establish a framework for a process to try to manage it. And it talks about, you know, hazards risk, financial risk, you know, strategic risk, reputational risk. Um, and, it, and it really is just a, a quite interesting document. So if you can, if you're building a, a system, uh, if you can get a hold of that and look at it, I, I just, I, I like it. I like the way it sets up a framework um, and it really is a, a management based process. Okay, so we're here to talk a little bit about ISO 45001. Um, yes, the, the first version of the standard uh, was uh, passed in, in, 2000, in, in March 12, 2018. And, and we're starting to see more and more interest. Um, you know, all the 
all the BM, BMW suppliers got interested because uh, they made that a, a customer requirement and and having you know ding and suppliers that haven't gotten certified yet on their scorecards and so forth. Uh, so they started the ball. Uh, a lot of companies are are putting together ISO 45001 frameworks, or we call it compliance systems. And um, you know they're they're not going all the way to certification, but they're trying to demonstrate that they are compliant to the standard. Um, and, and that's a possibility as well. So exactly like the environmental standard, same sections, 4.0 context of the organization, 5.0 leadership, a little bit different, and worker participation. That's a big deal. Uh, planning, you know, risk assessment, objectives, compliance obligations, same stuff, just as it applies to health and safety. Uh, support. Uh, operations, performance evaluation, and improvement. You know, exact same sections, a little bit more detail in some areas, but um, other than that, very similar to, to ISO 14001 and, and 9001 and IATF. You know, context of the organization, it, it took us a few years to figure out what that even meant. Um, you know, just, you know, Who's in, who are the stakeholders? Um, in a quality program, the stakeholders are very simple. It's, it's you, it's, it's your, 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 the ownership of your company and your customer, your suppliers. Um, in an environmental system, there's more stakeholders. And in a safety system, there's, there's more stakeholders. You've got your employees, you've got your neighbors, you've got the regulatory bodies, OSHA, my OSHA. Um, it, it's just a you know, an expectation that we're going to identify our stakeholders, what they what they expect from us, and um, you know, do they turn into compliance obligations? So again, here's a few examples of of different uh, you know stakeholders, you know, unions, uh, your stockholders, OSHA, the community, etc. And and one of your biggest stakeholders are your employees. You know, they expect organizations to have workers participate in the development and management of the occupational health and safety management system. Um, 5.0, we expect leadership. So for management to demonstrate leadership, commitment, and accountability, first step, they need to understand the program. And, and that it remains to be a gap in some of the environmental audits I do, where I get to organizations where management, you know, other than the person that handles the stuff, doesn't fully understand the environmental processes. You know, they can't demonstrate leadership if they don't understand the processes. And as an external auditor, it's very easy to understand when you walk into an organization, go into an opening meeting, whether management is demonstrating leadership or not. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, James. One more time. This is really very interesting. You're saying that you, when you do an audit, there is a, a an ignorance in the process from environmental point of view or from a safety point of view or both. Um, well, I would say a lot with environmental because management's been pretty in tune with safety for a while, but um, that that tends to be a gap on the environmental side. So um, yeah, we just have to make sure management understands what our program is and their responsibility. Uh, there's a requirement for a policy and, and, and again, that's pretty easy to, to inter integrate into your environmental policy if you choose to or have a separate policy. Um, and then organizational roles and responsibilities defined. And for some reason, because of the most important section of this this, this standard, I didn't put in 5.0 uh, worker participation. What was I thinking? Uh, oh, there it is. Did you catch that animation? Yes. Consultation and participation. And, and this is, um, you know, if you read the standard, there's specific areas where we're supposed to consult, uh, seek input from our uh, workers and employees, and there's other things that they need to participate in. Uh, things like incident investigation, 
establishing objectives. Um, you know, the, the standard gives you very specific areas where not only do they have to do it, but you have to have documentation of it. And, and in a lot of these areas, you're going to see things that you're already doing that you may not be documenting as well as you should or could or need to to demonstrate conformity. So at the tail end of this, we'll, we'll talk about a few of those areas and then ways that you guys can actually do that to, uh, quite quite easily. Hey, Jim, this is John Bozick. How you doing? Hey, John, good to see you. Yeah, um, question for you going back to that previous slide. Do you do you have or can you tell us the the areas in the standard where they do require employee participation? Um, so I, I I work in the chemical industry now, and we have to do responsible care. Yeah. Okay. And responsible care, um, you know, it's it's safety, security, and environmental all three. And um, the the responsible care standard is based off of the fourteen thousand standard, not the forty five thousand standards. Therefore. Okay. Therefore, when you get certified to responsible care, you also get a 14,000 certificate as well from the registrar. But ANAB, but ANAB will not give you the 45,000 because of what we're talking about. Okay. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and, and as a matter of fact, the chemical industry has gone so far as to try to say that responsible care exceeds 14,000 and 45,000. And you can't say that. You can say it exceeds 45, 14,000 because it includes security, but you can't say because of it with the 45,000. And we're trying to struggle with what are the gaps between there? And it boils down to this, this employee participation. And for example, we're getting a lot of push that it's not only do they have to participate in the investigations and corrective actions, but even the risk assessments that you do. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> yeah and, and there, you know, there's ways to, to to demonstrate that, that that aren't too tragic. I mean, the, the number one air, way that companies can sh can demonstrate participation is, is through their safety committees and, and what those agendas are and, and topics covered. And, and there's often a, a need to uh, insert some ISO topics into your safety committee meetings. Uh, but, but, but here's the section that specifically says, you know, where do we need to see evidence of how we've consulted workers and we don't have to consult every worker we just have to consult some workers and and that's why we can do a lot of this stuff inside the context of a safety committee um but but there's areas of we'll say consultation which is where we ask employees for feedback um and some of these are a little weird you know determining uh the needs and expectations of interested parties uh establishing the policy um, but again, if you do those things and you flash them up during a safety committee and you ask them for input and you document that, uh, that stuff's pretty straightforward. Uh, when you get to participation, um, again, here's the, the seven areas of specific places we need to see employees participate. Um, and it's the same thing there. You know, <laughs> how are we going to determine the mechanisms for their participation? Well, you know, but again, hazard identification and risk assessment, yes. You, but again, you may do the, the JHA, you may do the risk assessment, but you need some evidence that, that they've seen it, they've looked at it, they've, they've contributed to it, and they've participated in it. Um, you know. would, would, would the weekly safety talk uh, participation as part of that, the daily talk by the supervisors, also the work assignment, work instructions section or the JHA before they start a job, would all that be something that approve objective evidence that there is documentation and participation? If, if you've got the participation or the documentation, and, and again, this has to be evidence of a two-way road, not just you presenting information to them, but some notes or uh some way to demonstrate that they've given some feedback yeah yeah uh, mm -hmm. all those all those processes can 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 support these areas and i'm not going to interrupt but would suggestion be a good evidence of that yes a, a, okay. a, a good employee suggestion program is you know and, and here are some of the ways you know that that, that we see participation 
again, a robust safety committee, expand the agenda. Uh, if you've got a behavior-based safety process, that's a big one. Uh, Cross-functional inc incident investigation teams, representative of the of the of the issue. So, you you know you may have a bigger team you involved. You may have a bigger team involved with a recordable. Somebody, I need to meet somebody. Um, but you know, for a first aid injury, you don't need a big cross-functional team. Um, someone just talked about communications process, and again getting some feedback when you guys set up your performance goals, uh, again, a big deal. Okay, so, so far we've, we've got our contacts, we're showing some leadership. Uh, much like the 14,000 standard, the planning section's a big deal. Um, we've got a bunch of requirements here to identify hazards, uh, assess risk, and determine the needs for controls. Um, and, and this is pretty straightforward. Uh, and then we also have a section on a, 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 a establishing and documenting uh, occupational health and safety objectives. But the, the big difference between a compliance-based program and 45,000 is you need to expand the people you're, you're worried about. You know, a JHA does a good job looking at the employee's risk at a station. But you've got to look at, you know, visitors, uh, contractors, um, and you've got to look at all these you know, other people and how do you identify hazards to them, establishment of risk and establishment of controls. So you got to, you know, you know, you, you guys have all seen you know, some type of a risk matrix. That's nothing new. But again, we, we need to look at hazards relative to our employees. We, we probably do a good job of that. Uh, vendors and contractors, anybody that has access to the, the workplace, we have to demonstrate that we've identified hazards relative to them and potential risk. Um, it, can, it can include people in the vicinity of the workplace. So if you're working with a big chemical manufacturing company like like John is you you may have uh, you know large tanks toxic chemicals things that could create explosions uh, hazards relative to chemical exposures and, and, and you need to have uh, some evidence that you've, you've considered th those hazards and identified the risk relative to those hazards James related to the vendors and contractors, is it appropriate to request through your procurement process that they that your vendors and contractors do provide the hazards identification and risk assessment related to their own work? Uh, because to pre-plan in advance uh, the HIRA to include all possible vendors and all possible contractors and so on and all of their related work, is it appropriate that through procurement you would request for this to be done? I, yeah, I think so. You know, the standard talks about processes. Okay, you, you can have multiple processes to identify hazards and assess risk. So in the production areas, JHAs may be your process. Um, you know, with, with, and then they talk about routine activities versus non-routine activities. So if you've got a contractor coming in, you might have something like, I've seen them called like safe work permits, where the contractor fills out a permit relative to their work, that includes a portion on, on hazards and risk, and, and they would complete that either, as Bridges alluded, through, through the procurement process or just prior to them actually doing work. So th that's a great question because it, the, this hazard ID and risk assessment does not need to be the same tool for every area. You know, you, you could have a visitor procedure that, you know, visitors do this, they sign in, the, the escort's responsible, they get the PPE. Um, and then, I'm, and I saw one company on the bottom of all of their procedures and work instructions, they, they had an, a hazard ID and risk assessment for that job. And, and if I've got a, a visitor uh, safety procedure, 
it, what I've said is here's all the things I do to control the hazards relative to visitors, and here's my risk assessment for that activity. So again, there's a lot of different ways to do this, and um, but we just have to again not stay focused on the employee, but expand uh, these these processes to to different people. And and that's again another one of the bigger changes to go from your current system to the uh, system that would become certified to 45,001. And, and if anybody's interested, I, I've got a decent template for what I call a safe work permit or a contractor specific permit. If, you, if you're interested in that, send me an email and, and I'll forward that to you. Okay, so we know our contacts and interested parties. We've got some leadership. We've identified our hazards our compliance obligations, we've identified risk to the company, we've established occupational objectives, we've got worker participation. Uh, now under the support clause, again, we're gonna have adequate resources. Uh, we're gonna provide competency to people based on their training, education, and experience. There are certain issues they've gotta be aware of. We've gotta expand our awareness training. Uh, again, communications, we, we want the process to be more, more proactive, uh, even though on the safety front, I, I, think, um, I think a lot of organizations are, are pretty proactive, you know, toolbox talks, that kind of stuff. Uh, we're going to document some information and we're going to control the documentation. Um, again, that section, exactly like ISO 14000, except it applies to occupational health and safety. Um, section eight deals with uh, operational control and, uh, and, and planning. Uh, well, what are we trying to control? We're trying to control our identified hazards, any anticipated risk, and anything re related to our compliance obligations. Again, most of the stuff you have already got, You've got a documented lockout tagout program. You've got a documented forklift safety program. You, you've got, uh, you know, you've got dock locks. You, you've got, you know, GHS labeling. I mean, most of these programs you've already got developed won't require you to do anything. Uh, elimination of hazards. Okay, how do we do that? Well, we do it through employee suggestion program. We do it if you have a behavior-based safety process. Um, if incident investigation designed to minimize and eliminate risk, probably got most of those areas in, in place. Um, but again, we may have to improve how those things are documented. Uh, you know, some some companies have very good management of change processes. They're they're, they're just defined. They're documented. Uh, they have considerations for safety in them. Um, others, the management of change process is focused on quality. Uh, maybe you've got a machine startup process. Maybe you've got a new chemical approval process. But those would all be management of change processes. So if you look at the standard, there, there are specific types of changes the standard asks you to, to consider and review. And uh, you'll just need to make sure that you've got evidence of that documentation family crisis um procurement again not you know again not a lot of new stuff but probably some areas where you've got to enhance your uh, some documentation uh general procurement you just to make sure as you buy things that th there is a consideration for safety and you know things like ppe specifications and that kind of stuff uh contractors again we've got to you know, have a good process to orientate our contractors to our safety rules. Uh, again, most sites I go to do that, but you'd be surprised. A lot of smaller companies still don't have a good way to prove that they've explained their safety rules to their their contractors, which personally I feel opens them up to some some liability. Uh, outsourcing, if you outsource things. Again, what what are the safety considerations for that as well? And and then lastly, uh, emergency preparedness and response. Um, 
it's it's the same stuff you've got already. You know, an emergency action plan, medical um, response, really no new requirements there other than the potential need to test and review uh, your responses during um, any other uh, emergency condition. James, with regard to this section, before I let you uh, skip it, is there some machinery or devices that we related to safety that you could think of that could uh, we could uh, we 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 should or we must calibrate or uh, PM or things of that nature that you could think of? Um, yeah, the, the, there's a lot of. I mean, the, you, you've got your your first aid inspections, eye wash stations, um, your your harness inspections. Um, I mean, that, that's all stuff that, that you need to maintain and, and you have records for. Um, if you do any industrial hygiene testing for noise or air quality, uh, those types of things would require calibration, uh, that kind of stuff. Ladder, ladder. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, again, hierarchy of controls, this is nothing new for the safety professionals here. But it, it, when they when they talk about risk Burning. reduction and and a consideration for the, the hierarchy of controls, um, you know, and you need again, this is another area where depending on how you document this in your incident investigation or your corrective action process, you, you may need to um, in, improve the documentation for that. Okay, uh, management of change. Uh, again, um, very specific uh, requirements to, to have evidence that you're reviewing things as they're changing. Um, it's not just about a change in a, in a tool. Um, you know, changes in the workplace, organization, new legal requirements, uh, changes in technology, um, et cetera. Uh, emergency response, again, um, same section for, for environmental. Uh, you've got to identify emergency situations. Uh, and this can be different. You know, if there's a medical emergency. Uh, you could require a working at heights uh, at rescue. Uh, uh, James, to, to uh, I'm support. sorry. I'm sorry, to, but it looks like you are talking and you're talking to um, uh, display that is not what you're talking about. <laughs> it's coming late. What's that? Uh, there is a lag between what you're saying and and the uh, slide. Oh no. Yeah. Well, what slide are you seeing right now? I'm seeing two at the at eight each other, but the management of change is just coming a little bit more clearly now. Okay, are you seeing yeah, okay. emergency, yeah. emergency response? Emergency preparedness, yes, and emergency response. <laughs> okay. I found this to be changing okay. Okay, thank you. Give me one more second. Okay, so I'm, I'm hoping everybody can see 8.2 emergency preparedness and response. Uh, um, no, it went away. It went away. Yes, I see it. Okay. I see it. Okay, Jawad, it sounds like it's on problems on your end. Uh, Sorry. Okay. So again, not a lot of extra work here to, to be updated to the standard. Uh, just some evidence that you, you're reviewing things after a test or an actual occurrence of an emergency. Um, it, again, if you've got people going into confined spaces, you, you should do a confined space entry driller test. Uh, if you have people working at heights, you should periodically do a 
rescuing from heights type of a drill. Um, people have a lot of, um, or, or tend to have a lot of medical things that they can say, well, we, we don't need to do an actual drill for that. Okay. Next section is on performance evaluation. A again, um, we're, we're gonna we're gonna monitor and measure and analyze our safety performance. Um, there's a little bit of a, a push to go from lagging indicators to leading indicators. Be becoming a little bit more proactive. Uh, we're gonna evaluate our compliance relative to our compliance obligations, whether it's OSHA or other requirements. Uh, internal auditing, same requirements. We're, we're gonna have qualified auditors. Um, it's very easy to integrate uh, environmental and, and safety management system audits together if your system's integrated. Um, again, the auditors need to be objective. You shouldn't be auditing your own work. And again, if you're auditing environmental and safety, just make sure that you're sampling both areas of information. Um, and, and again, 9.3 management review, same exact requirements as 14, just data from your occupational health and safety system. Um, again, just a few examples, you know, the old lagging indicators of the frequency rates, uh, OSHA recordables, lost days, maybe first aid injuries. Um, you know, your leading indi indicators can be your, uh, you know, unsafe observations, your, your behavior-based safety observations, uh, safety audit results, safety training completed, uh, ergonomic assessments, that kind of stuff. Improvement again. We've got you know I don't know why they separate 10-1 and 10-3, whatever. 10-1 um, says you're going to identify opportunities to improve and reduce risk, and you're going to implement plans. Very similar to setting objectives. Again, I don't know why they made it different, but they did. 10.3 uh, says you're going to improve continually and try to enhance your safety performance. Um, both improvement opportunities. And again, incident investigation, nonconformity, corrective action. Um, <coughs> this, um, there's, there's a little bit of different stuff here versus 14 and, and take a look at it. You know, there's a, you know, there's a requirement to, decide your corrective actions and then assess the risk of that corrective action prior to implementation. Um, many organizations have one corrective action process for non-conformances and they have another corrective action process for incidents and that's fine. The, um, the problem becomes a lot of these uh, software based incident reporting and investigation uh, programs were not built for the ISO requirements. So what do we do? Well, we're not going to buy new software probably. Um, what you have to do is take a look at the ISO requirements for documentation and then your incident investigation software. And then, you know, in certain fields where either you might have, you know, free text writing, you need to populate some of that information in those fields. So again, that, that's something that's a pretty common nonconformance in a 45,000 audit is where they go through their incident investigation software, but it, it doesn't include all of the requirements for corrective action under, under the ISO process. So that that is the, the standard in a, in a nutshell. Um, you know, many companies are now going through the, the certification process and it's just like 14,000, um, you know, they're gonna come out and do a stage one assessment to make sure you're ready and then come in and do a stage two assessment. Now, I've seen 
re different registration companies handle this stuff differently. Some do a very good job of, you know, if, if once you get 45,000 certified, they'll, they'll do a good job integrating the certification audits, even though they're auditing the two different standards. Um, some registration companies don't do such a great job with that. Uh, that'll be dependent on your on the company, but but your initial uh, initial forty five thousand certification, you know, will require a stage one, probably a day on site, and then a stage two certification audit based on the size of your organization. And and companies are are already um, going to these group certifications, where they might certify five, 10, 15 plants on one certificate. Um, so, so that is a possibility to, to set up a, a group certificate with a sampling plan. And, and if you guys have questions about that, uh, just shoot me an email. Uh, we can set up a quick call and I, I can answer some of those questions. Um, this particular slide, you know, just shows a lot of the areas that you probably already have, uh, have developed. And, and I've attached the, the requisite clause of the standard. So your, your safety committees, you know, obviously support um, participation, but they can also come up with risk reduction opportunities and opportunities for improvement. Your, your job hazard assessments is a, is a good start to your risk assessments. Uh, you probably already identified your relevant OSHA requirements. Uh, maybe that needs to be documented better. But but again, most of you already have, again, I'll call it a hybrid uh, safety management process in place. Um, in many of these areas, you'll probably have to improve or update the, the documentation to, to better uh, support conformance to the, the ISO 45000 standard. Um, again, as far as how to get started, again, you, you want to make sure you've got management support. If and, and that that can take a lot of a lot of fronts, you know they're going to support it with time, with with the with the energy, with some with the budget for some training maybe. Um, the first thing is look at your existing safety, fourteen thousand and quality programs, integrate things to the extent you can. <coughs> We don't want to recreate duplicate systems just for safety. Um, you, you want to come up with a good plan. Uh, what resources do you need internally? Don't make this a one or two man show. Set up a cross-functional team. Uh, what training do they need on the standard? <coughs> do we have an external budget maybe for a, a compliance assessment? Those types of things set up a realistic schedule for, for implementation, not too short, but not too long. <coughs> and, and then provide regular updates to the management team just so they know what's, what's occurring. Um, again, there's a lot of ways we can help. The number one way we can help is to answer your questions. And, and I say this every time I do anything, send me an email, send me a text message <coughs> anytime with, with any kind of a question because I, I really want companies to set these programs up so that they're effective, so that they're easy to manage. <coughs> I'm sorry, I needed more water. So that when your certification auditor's there, it's easy for them to see it. And, and we've got, I've got some tools I will share with you um, if you need somebody to come in and do some training, we can, obviously we can do that. Um, if you need some internal auditors trained, we're, we're going to set some classes up. And, and, and right now we're focused primarily on doing integrated audits. Um, so we'll have a course coming up in that. Um, if you're just getting ready to implement the program, um, obviously we can come in and do some on-site stuff. Or we do a lot of stuff remote now, so it keeps expenses low. But, but again, the first step is if you have a question, send me a, a, 
an email or a text. And questions are always free. And if I can make your process a little quicker or clear up some cloudy confusion, that that uh, that makes me happy, and I, and I and I like to do that. Um, yeah, it's just more marketing crap. Um, but um, in the next few months, we we are going to do a full six hour, how to implement a forty five thousand and one program. Uh, that will include, uh, you know, detailed discussion on each section of the standard. We'll go through a you know risk assessment process and some tools for that. Uh, we'll, we'll go through a lot of different uh, electronic things that I, I will share with you. Uh, and again, uh, if your organization is considering implementing this from square one, uh, this may not be a, a bad first step but for, for people to go through. How do we hey, sign up for that, Jim? There is, there's my contact information. And I, I heard a question. Who is this? This is Sean Horn at Valero, Jim. I wanted to ask you a question if you can answer. What the? Sean who? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, Sean, you look great, buddy. You know, I, I saw your name pop up. I go, what? what is that guy doing? I, I, I'm glad to talk to you, Sean. Yeah. So have you done any work to map out uh, 45,001 against OSHA's Voluntary Protection Program? Hey, man. You know, I tell you, I haven't yeah. done that exercise myself, but I, I, I have worked with some companies that are VPP certified. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of commonality. And, and again, if you've, if you've already got the VPP system in place, um, rather than change that to, to try to be 45,000, I would just try to integrate 45,000 into what you're already doing and then just, you know, just add the extra requirements in there right yeah i was interested in that i just didn't know if anybody had gone that route yet or for that matter gone from forty-five thousand and one to vpp and obtained the certification yeah how and, difficult and again, that would be I, I don't think that would be difficult at all yeah. you know it's the same with a lot of environmental programs if you're already fourteen thousand certified they just check a box check and you're and you're, you're you're most of the way there um, but I, I, I just be transparent. I, I haven't done a ton of work with the VPP standard and, and what it takes. Um, I, I have worked with some companies that are certified to that or part of that program. Uh, but I got to envision that it's there, there's not going to be a lot of extra stuff to, to go to, to to be certified to the 45,000 standard. Okay. Very good. So I was interested in. Okay. And any other questions at this point? silence how, how do we get uh, this presentation is it uh, in a via email or is it available that we could go back and read it yeah i'll i'll, I'll send out a, a pdf of this to everybody please okay well i i appreciate you guys showing up and, and again uh, a lot of you guys are existing customers lear magna itw um, the other folks, we, we'd like to work with you. Uh, if you have any questions, though, you know, I don't always see this. There was a, there's a chat. People are chatting with me. Um, but yeah, just, uh, you know, feel free to give me a call, uh, email, a text message is probably work better. But uh, I, I just love making this stuff uh, understandable for people. Um, if we can share some information that makes your life better, I, I feel good about that. And then if you ultimately need some support with implementation, we're there, we're there to do that as well. So with that, I will say goodbye, and I appreciate you showing up, and thank you very much.